The name Dysert is said to have come from the Latin deserted place. Caves were named after St. Serf, who, as legend has it, drove the devil out of Dysert. These ancient caves became a place of worship and Christian pilgrimage. They are located in the grounds of what is now the Carmelite Monastery. The St. Clair family were the principal landowners of Dysert for centuries. At Ravenscraig Castle, a baronial court is held, where taxes are collected from markets and ships. Lord St. Clair, welcome to Fife. So our sovereign lord, James III, has demanded you give him the Orkney Islands. Aye, but for it he's bestowed upon me the lands of Ravenscraig and this fine castle. And I've made its town of Dysart a borough too. So its tax and trade shall come unto me. <laughs> the shadow of the Black Death ended such fortunes. In 1584, over half of Dysart inhabitants fell prey to the plague. Fear led to rampant superstition. In the 1600s, Dysart, like Weems and Kirkcaldy, were gripped in the witch hunt hysteria. In Dysart, the accused were taken to the Red Rocks, their fates sealed. Dysart's magnificent Tollbooth Tower was used to house prisoners, accused witches and other troublemakers. After the English Civil War, Cromwell's victorious army crossed the border into Scotland, defeating the Scottish armies of the National Covenant. Dysart found itself under military occupation. English troops converted the toll booth into a barracks and gunpowder store until one intoxicated soldier It would take some years before the toll booth was rebuilt. The people of Dysart prayed at St. Serfs. This church was uniquely designed as a place of worship and a defensive fortification. The congregation sat in accordance to profession, tradesmen marking their spots with symbols of their trade. In time, the old church has become a romantic ruin, captivating the imagination of visitors. For centuries, Dysart's industries remained unchanged. One of the most accessible occupations was salt panning. Heavy iron pans containing seawater were heated to evaporate moisture, leaving behind the salt, and Dysart became known as the Salt Borough. Competition sent salt panning into decline. Meanwhile, the coal industry thrived, and coal was transported to nearby Dysart Harbour for export. By 1860, there were three pits in operation, the Randolph, Francis, and Lady Blanche. The textiles industry flourished. So competitive was the need for weavers that employers such as Normans built new homes to lure the workers. Entire streets such as Weaver's Row included their own workshops. The textiles industry would continue to grow and great structures joined the mines to dominate the Dysart coastline. But the true heart of Dysart lies in its harbour. As early as 1450, Dysart was recorded as a port, trading in salt and coal across Europe. Yet the harbour we recognise today was not built until the 1750s. Stone blocks were placed over natural reefs to produce piers, and later, a wet dock carved from a nearby stone quarry. 
desert harbored many vessels, trading from ports far and wide, from the Cape of Good Hope to the Americas and Europe. We can imagine the wild tales of sailors, inspiring such famous sons as the explorer of Australia, John McDowell Stewart, or the war hero, John Pitcairn. Dysart's main trading partner was the Netherlands. Many merchants of Dysart became so taken with the architecture and culture of the place that Dysart soon reflected Dutch influence. Some even called the place Little Holland. Merchants stored their goods in the Harbour Master House, and records suggest all manner of goods ranging from European timber to cheese from Aberdeen. The men charged with guiding the ships into the harbour were called pilots, some of whom proved to be mischievous characters. One such crafty pilot attempted to extort more than the standard charge from a Danish skipper, the consequences becoming part of Dysart folklore. Despite incidents of bad behaviour, the town council found it difficult to dismiss these characters, popular in the local community. In one case, over 300 locals petitioned for the reinstatement of a sacked pilot. In 1881, the St. Clair family became the Earls of Roslyn. Both ownership of the mines and many business properties made their management vital to the economy of Dysart. The fourth Earl, Robert Francis, was known for his love of horses. James Francis Harry became the fifth Earl of Roslyn, but he did not enjoy the financial successes of his forebears. By the end of his life, the thriving coal industry had begun a decline, and with it, the financial viability of the harbour. The boom times had ended, and in 1930, Dysart was amalgamated with Kirkcaldy. In the 1960s, many old streets in Dysart were destroyed and redeveloped as flats. Ironically, as of 2008, these buildings now share the fate of their forebears, demolition. Fortunately, 16th century buildings such as Pan Ha were preserved for posterity, along with many other unique cultural and historical buildings. But as well as embracing its past, the people of Dysart are looking to the future. The next five years will see great investment in Dysart, with improvements to the harbour area and residential development in the borough. Preserved and restored, the Harbour Master's House now provides a vital resource for those exploring the landscapes, history and culture of Fife. The Harbour Master's House comprises a visitor centre with interactive displays and a popular cafe bistro. Fife Coast and Countryside Trust operate the building. We invite you to come and learn more about Dysart and other fascinating communities that lie along the Fife coastal path. Dysart's history is one of ambitious sea trade and famous adventurers, an exciting place where community loyalty and local pride is paramount. Despite amalgamation with Kirkcaldy in more recent times, Dysart has retained its unique cultural and community identity that will charm and entice visitors for years to come.